So our first speaker is uh, Ian Byrne from Amnesty International's International Secretariat. Ian is head of the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights team for Amnesty, and he's going to address the broad question of the link between human rights and economics in the context of the economic crisis. He'll outline the nature of the government's obligation to respect, protect and fulfil human rights, and the concepts of using maximum available resources to progressively realise those protections over time. He'll also touch on the overall global impact on human rights of the economic crisis, the need to take a proactive approach to protecting rights, and some of the accountability mechanisms uh, that need to be put in place. So I'll hand you over to Ian. Thank you, Coleman. Thank you to all of you for, for coming along today. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, firstly, just a couple of apologies. Um, Firstly, um, as you might have um, noticed maybe on the original agenda, Audrey Gochran, who's head of the Global Thematics Programme, uh, was supposed to be giving this presentation. Unfortunately, Audrey can't do that, so you've got me instead. Um, and as Colm said, I'm due to, to give some other presentations during the day as well. And secondly, I don't have a slide presentation, so if people are okay, I'm going to sit here and uh, read from the briefing paper, which hopefully you've all got in your packs and this was a briefing paper that Audrey and other colleagues prepared as a briefing note that we issued round about the time of the World Economic Forum in Davos. And as Colm said, I think it's important to look at these issues in the broader context and what I find very interesting and what I really want to focus on in my presentation is we have a time when human rights seem to be under attack in many quarters, whether you look at in uh, the European system, in the inter-America system, uh, around at the UN as well at the global level. There are many states who are trying to push back on human rights. We see special rapporteurs, special experts, often under unprecedented attack for trying to do their work uh, and other institutions. And at the same time, as Colm has already said, and I want to really emphasize and hopefully will come through today, human rights should not be seen as antithetical to economic development and economic advancement and, and the promotion of business, but actually providing intrinsic added value to the process, and that the two should not be working at odds with each other, but that the human rights can provide a consistent normative framework that can be used both by states, by business, by individuals, by civil society to monitor uh, the impact of economic policy, of the economic crisis upon human rights, and actually through doing that, actually come up with actually uh, more rigorous, more consistent policies that will actually improve people's living standards in the longer term. I think the challenge for all of us working in different capacities, and often you have these debates, and it will be obviously interesting, I think, today to have some of these debates, because often one is coming along and, and preaching to the converted, if you like, in that many people are convinced about that, obviously, economic and social rights are justiciable uh, and are enforceable, whereas still in many quarters around the world, not just in governments, there is still a, a, a conservative attitude to these rights, a belief that there is a hierarchy of rights uh, and that economic and social rights are not true rights. And hopefully we will, through this dialogue today, dispel some of those myths, see the indivisible nature of both sets of rights, civil and political, economic, social and cultural, in working in practice. Because you see all of these kind of principles uh, put forward in, you know, dating back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. And I think it's sometimes it's important to realize that, that economic and social rights have been around a long, long time, and in fact, even predating that back to the 19th century. And so to use the added value of human rights, not as Colm said, in some kind of silo and some kind of thing that is really related to maybe issues that people traditionally see rights maybe as focusing on, which is you know torture, free speech, fair trial, important all of those things are, and of course, the fact that some of those rights can be used very much in terms of process issues, which I want to come on to talk to at the same time. But that the development, the corpus of economic and social rights, law, standards, principles that we now have in place, provide 
uh, this important normative framework. And as at the same time, as Colm said, there are developments uh, that are happening at the international level, which one of the most significant is this new complaints mechanism, the optional protocol that, that Ireland has signed and hopefully will soon ratify and will soon come into force. And as I said, I will talk about that later today. But I think that is a very timely initiative as well, because I think that will allow the UN to examine hard cases and look at hard decisions, policy decisions that governments have to make, resource choices. And we'll have to grapple with some of these things, which will be good for the UN, but also hopefully, uh, if it is done in both a rigorous way, but also in a constructive, engaged way with states, will actually, again, provide added value. It should not be seen as a threat. And I think that's, that's a very important point. So as I said, I'm not going to go in the time I've got through all of the briefing paper in detail. Uh, you've got it there in your packs. But what I want to draw out, obviously, is some of the key issues that Amnesty has been highlighting uh, through our work, both in terms of our economic and social rights, uh, policy and campaigning work, but also our corporate accountability work uh, as well. And as I said, um, we all know the impact of the economic crisis that has now been with us uh, for at least five years and manifesting itself in different forms. And the sheer numbers there of people affected and being, people, people being pushed below the poverty line. In 2009 alone, the World Bank estimated there were some 50 million people, additional, additional people, had fallen into poverty because of the economic crisis, and that 64 million more will be pushed into poverty by the end of 2011. And again, you hear these massive statistics. Um, you know, the ILO talking about nearly 30% of all workers in the world, more than 900 million people, nearly a billion people, living with their families below the US $2 a day poverty line in 2011. So you can keep on, keep on churning out these statistics. But of course, for, for individuals and families, this is a personal tragedy. And the fact that they're not even enjoying what we would regard as the minimum essential levels uh, of goods and services, then potentially uh, puts their rights at risk and potentially violates their rights. And as we say, the figures call into question the sustainability of poverty reduction programs based on the market if governments fail to appropriately regulate the market. The market um, and cuts in government spending in areas of house, uh, health, housing, and social services will affect or will be affecting people's ability to access even minimum essential levels of these services. And without safety nets to mitigate the impacts, the effects, as we all know, will be felt most harshly by disadvantaged groups in each society. And again, that's, of course, where human rights, and I'll come on to talk about this later on, can and should play a significant role in terms of both monitoring impact and looking for effective remedies for individuals. And again, that's something I really want to emphasize as well. Um, as a human rights lawyer, I very much believe in, and I've got many lawyers, I think, in the room today, in that a right without a potential remedy sometimes is not much of a right at all. And the need to gain redress, and that n might not mean going to court, but it might mean affecting significant policy change uh, to ensure that both future violations are prevented and we don't keep getting repetition of similar systemic violations occurring, but also that there's appropriate redress for violations that have occurred in the past. And it's very much focusing on the obligations of states. And the fact that states have ratified, as Ireland has done, and the UK and other countries across the world now, a range of different human rights treaties that are binding in law uh, means that they do have these obligations. You know, I was listening to a debate in the UK over the weekend, which we're still debating, you probably know, about prisoners' voting rights. And the fact that I think, again, we're going to have um, you know, uh, other votes in the UK Parliament about uh, whether we should comply with this. And this very selective approach to states' obligations not only completely undermines the nature of international law, but places states in very much a hypocritical position about then to having dialogue with other states 
about obviously complying with their obligations. So if Ireland is failing in its own obligations, how can it then focus on the impacts in the global south and have dialogue with other states as well? And the way that the international normative framework has looked at obligations, and I don't want to make this into a law lecture, but in a very brief way, is looking at a topology, what we call of respect, protect, and fulfill. And it's not only respecting my own rights and not doing something negatively, which is, more, which is what we tend to think about with human rights uh, violations. So obviously, for the state not to be torturing me, not to be unduly restricting my free speech, uh, but also can apply in terms of economic and social rights. So for example, not forcibly evicting me from a house, but respecting my own right to housing. But particularly at this session, I really want to focus on the protect and the fulfill. And obviously at the protect level, that implies that the state is under a duty to regulate other actors, other non-state actors. And particularly in this context, I would say business and corporations. And this has been explicitly recognized by example uh, by the UN Human Rights Council and also the um, special expert on business, uh, which also is what I referred to in the paper in terms of the various principles by which states, uh, by which corporations and business should respect human rights. So that notion of regulation, which we talk about in a very general sense, and the fact that I think it's been generally recognized even amongst the most conservative commentators, it has been a systemic failure to regulate, obviously, the banking industry and other corporate actors. But no one is linking it to human rights obligations. And this is what I think you, those of us who work in human rights find frustrating, in that the discourse, as I said, whenever human rights crops up, and as I said, I live in the UK, so I don't wish to speak about experience here in Ireland, but I'm sure it's similar often is that human rights is seen as very much in this negative and also in this very narrow frame that human rights is posited, um, largely in relation to maybe the European Convention on Human Rights and how we can somehow get out of certain obligations that, that, that our government doesn't really want to uh, uh, adhere to because of the political or economic cost. And then we talk about the obligation to fulfill rights. And here, of course, yes, fulfilling rights does mean allocation of resources. And it means what we call, as Comer said, progressive realization over time to achieve uh, that ultimate goal of better fulfilling people's rights. But certain rights have to be and should be implemented immediately. And particularly when we are talking about issues to do around non-discrimination, so again, the need to address particularly vulnerable and marginalized groups, but also guaranteeing minimum essential levels of rights. And you might say, well, how do we then uh, adjudicate that? And we might come on to that in the hard questions session at the end of the day. But for example, in the relation to health, you're talking about primary health care. In relation to housing, you're talking at the very least of minimum essential levels of shelter. So that nobody should drop below that minimum essential level. And if they do that, then states, again, are in breach of their obligations. So I put it to you, and Amnesty's belief is that we have a normative framework there. Yes, sometimes it needs further development and unpacking, and that's why, as I said, the fact that we'll soon have this international complaints mechanism at the UN will allow that, will allow the committee to look and develop more some of these principles in relation to hard cases, and I think that will be important. And the paper goes on to talk about three broad ways in which we believe that states through the human rights approach, should be responding to this crisis. And what we are asking states to do is to carry out comprehensive and a transparent assessment of the impacts of any proposed cuts in expenditure on the enjoyment of economic, social, and cultural rights, and to put in place safety nets to minimize such impacts. And the first of these is learning lessons and heeding warnings from the past. We know we've been here before. Yes, this economic crisis in many ways might be longer, and I think that's what has really you know, been maybe unprecedented about it, uh, and maybe in some respects deeper than before. But we have to learn the lessons of what has gone on before. And again, I'm not going to go into all the detail, but if you see in the paper, there's been obviously a, a whole plethora of reports carried out by the World Bank, the IMF, not exactly a very 
human rights friendly institutions, but even then recognizing that some to, there's been a negative impact and a failure really to learn the impacts, for example, on structural adjustment, on deepening poverty and human rights, um, and other reports by UNICEF and other bodies. And a, a more recent report in 2011 by the UN's Department of Economic and Social Affairs, DISA, noted that international financial institutions, despite having declared changes in their policy prescriptions, have paid insufficient attention to the social implications of, that, of such studies. And so the legal implications of states include an implicit requirement to consider how government policy and action will affect rights. But of course, that begs the question whether states are always geared up to be able to monitor this. Are they in a position to be able to integrate human rights assessment, impact assessment through their policy decision making and resource allocation? Do they have series of, do they collect and monitor disaggregated data and develop series of human rights based indicators? And if you look at the reports that are put up often to the UN, you will see and not just states in the global south, which you might think are states that would maybe lack sometimes the resources, the capacity, the expertise to do this, but generally across the board, states are failing to do this. And if you can't monitor the impact, if you can't produce disaggregated data to be able to see where the impacts are on the most vulnerable and marginalized, particularly groups that often obviously fall under the radar, such as migrants, for example, uh, or, the, or, or the travelers, say, here in Ireland, then you're not in a position to provide appropriate responses. So I think there's still a lot more work. There's a huge gap sometimes between, as I said, the, the rhetoric in that states want to ratify treaties, they want to be seen sometimes as to be promoting human rights, but in terms of actually fulfilling their obligations, there is still a long way to go. And as I said, this really connects with the second issue, which is applying this non-discrimination lens to crisis response and prioritizing the most disadvantage. I've already said that non-discrimination is an immediate obligation. So even if your resources are limited in terms of um, adjustment policies that you need to make to cushion people from the worst effects of um, cuts, etc., you really should be in a position to ensure that it doesn't fall on the most disadvantaged. And yet we know that is the case. And the Committee on Economic and Social Rights at the UN has said the fact that even in times of severe resource constraints, whether caused by a process of adjustment or economic recession or by other factors, the vulnerable members of society can and indeed must be protected by the adoption of relatively low cost targeted programs. So there we have it, Mitt Romney's 47% are the people actually that he should not be forgetting about. Thankfully, he didn't get into office, but let's see what happens now in Obama's second term. But of course, the obverse actually is, in, is actually the one that should come into play in that those are the people that actually should be the targeted the most. And we talk about in our briefing, obviously, particularly, <coughs> we all know the multiple impacts of discrimination on women. And the World Bank has already predicted that the economic crisis will result in higher infant mortality rates for girls and boys and families pulling girls out of school as household finances are reduced and decreased access for women to loans and credit necessary to run businesses and households. And as I've already said, again, another very vulnerable group is migrants. And an important point I wish to emphasize here is the economic crisis, as we know, has been often used as a pretext for governments to carry out retrogressive policies against migrant groups. And I'm not saying that this is a sort of classic scapegoating that, that goes on when times are hard. But often, as you, say, as you see, and again, we've got quotes there you know, from the UK Prime Minister Cameron, we're blaming mass immigration for pressures on communities up and down the country, on schools, housing, and healthcare. Uh, Chancellor Merkel in Germany saying multiculturalism has utterly, utterly failed, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so, as again, you, you know, what you see is the complete reverse of what the state should be doing in relation to their human rights obligations. And the sad fact is, I think, is that um, this obviously plays into prejudices and stereotypes. And at the same time, there's a general lack of public awareness, I would say, pretty much in all countries of the world, of amongst the general public, of, of what, A, their human rights are, what other people's rights are, and the obligations that states have signed up to. I bet you, maybe you've already done it, but if you did a poll 
in Ireland of what you know what treaties have you signed up to I mean people might some people might know the European Convention on Human Rights I put it to you probably not many people know about the European Social Charter and even less people know about the range of UN treaties and that's a challenge I think for civil society it's a challenge for the international and regional systems that promote uh, and obviously monitor these treaties uh, but there's also a challenge there for governments, national human rights institutions, to do more awareness raising about these obligations. The fact these obligations are binding in law. And as I said, what I do find, you know, these two parallel conversations are going on. You've got the economic crisis, and we need to do something about it, and then kind of human rights is off there in the distance and occasionally pops up when there's some kind of unpopular issue that somehow has to be blamed on, on a foreign court to handing down some human rights judgment. And the final thing I really want to, to focus on is the notion of accountability and transparency. And we know, obviously, that accountability is vital to the meaningful protection of rights. Um, and in the context of the current economic crisis, the failure to prevent corporate malpractice and bad practice was a root cause of the economic crisis, and therefore a key factor in human rights impacts. States have to engage with the clear evidence of the link between the lack of regulation of financial systems and markets and negative human rights impacts and examine how to give effect to their legal responsibility to protect rights. And obviously, as I said, over the last 10 years particularly, we've seen a lot more focus about non-state actors, corporations, and the obligations that they have also to be human rights compliant. And as I said, we now have these guiding principles on business and human rights that have been endorsed by the UN Human Rights Council, and they provide clear starting points for state actions. The principle state, state should enforce laws that are aimed at or have the effect of acquiring business enterprises to respect human rights, periodically to assess the adequacy of such laws and address any gap, and provide effective guidance to business enterprises on how to respect human rights throughout their operations. Now, of course, the problem with a lot of this is there's no real effective sanctions for compliance. But that's an issue more broadly about, which maybe again we'll come on to in the hard question session at the end of the day, um, that you know, we, generally when it comes to state obligations at the international level, there's very little sanctions, if any, that are available apart from some kind of naming and shaming. And again, this whole dialogue that has gone on under Kofi Annan with business, about the corporate compact, the notion that we can't force you, we can't really hold you to account in terms of human rights violations, but we want you to at least acknowledge them and respect them and use them as a normative framework. And in so doing, actually improve your own business practices. So they are seen as more than just a good PR exercise, but again, they can actually improve the way that a company functions. And that obviously is a change of mind. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's a cultural shift in thinking that human rights are not antithetical to good business practice, but actually can be integral to it. But there has to be effective regulation. Um, and that includes, you know, linking between uh, also the nature between what we see not just unethical practices but corrupt practices and the notion that this can obviously then feed into increasing inequality and the fact of you see obviously the way that the credit has been given to particularly poor groups, getting them into debt, the foreclosure crisis across Europe and, and the US. Um, this should be the time actually for economic and social rights to come to the fore. This is the crisis time. And it's not, really. I, or, you know, I'd be interested, obviously, in other people's points of view and, and from colleagues who are, who are working on the ground as well. But you know, actually, how do we get human rights into this dialogue about the economic crisis? Because all of these principles, accountability, transparency, are there. The notion of due process, which obviously links up both fundamental civil rights and economic and social rights as well. So, um, in closing, um, what Amnesty International has been asking for, and we're going to increase uh, our campaigning work on during the next 12 months, is for states to carry out transparent assessments of any impacts of proposed cuts and expenditure on the enjoyment of rights, assessing the risk of discriminatory impacts on marginalized groups, and to put in place mitigation measures or safety nets to minimize negative impacts, to ensure that nobody is denied those minimum essential levels of rights. And that cuts are justified according to stringent criteria. What we'd like to see is budgeting processes reflect these legal obligations. But again, 
human rights, I would say, you know, within the corridors of Whitehall or here in Dublin, I would imagine that in many decisions that go on within uh, economic ministries, within treasuries, that human rights is really not there. Human rights is something that the foreign ministry deals with and somebody goes to Geneva or somebody goes to New York. It's not integral in the process. And, and th th we are going to have a session, I know, the speaker on budgeting. And I think, again, this is a very important, and it is technical, process. Um, but, if you, but, but human rights does provide that consistent normative framework. And as I said, I think particularly now with the UN International Optional Protocol coming into force, this provides us with a good opportunity not only to raise greater awareness and promote economic and social rights, but it will give the UN a greater chance to, I think, to interrogate some of these hard decisions. We've already seen there's a slew of cases have gone from countries in Europe, particularly Greece. A whole series of cases have gone to the European Social Charter Committee. Um, and I suspect that there will be many cases that are born out of this current economic crisis that will end up at the UN. And hopefully through that process, we will see a greater interrogation of why states have not really adopted a more pro-human rights approach in their work. So thank you very much. It's of course a simple fact that international human rights law is provided by states. States agree these treaties. States created these treaties. So it's an important question for us to consider. Well, if these treaties have been agreed by states, if states have then voluntarily signed up to these treaties, why are they not uh, in any way influencing policy practice or law at the national level, particularly in the context of the current economic crisis. And one of the things that we might want to consider is that because, generally speaking, perhaps states like Ireland, who have a strong human rights tradition, have been champions internationally for human rights, uh, see the drafting of such laws as, as, as classic law as coercive on other rather than placing clear obligations on self as being a framework that we can use to apply to deal with tough and difficult questions. And, you know, to what degree, and that's what today is really meant to help us to begin to draw out, what is the value of, of applying the human rights framework in the current context? What are the solutions that are provided for states in dealing with difficult questions around, yes, economic and social cultural rights, yes, around how you develop policy, allocate resources, provide you know, uh, solutions in really constrained, financially constrained t times to very, very difficult uh, uh, and complex issues and situations. We came out of a boom era, and Ignacio is going to speak to that in a moment, a time when, like an awful lot of the world, but it was certainly true for us here in Ireland, we had so much money that we didn't have to answer these questions. It seemed that they didn't matter so much. It's not simply the case that was what was up until now a marginalised issue that most of Ireland ignored, poverty, uh, and economic and social cultural rights crisis is now a mainstream issue. It's a fact that it's a pressing economic issue for us and for our state. We don't have as much money. How do we use that to greatest effect? And what we want to explore today is how can this framework of law, agreed by states, signed up to by Ireland, obligations accepted by this state, how can this help us to chart a way through and to develop uh, better solutions uh, to these huge and complex problems?